Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is up close and personal, which I wasn't quite expecting. It feels a little like an, like an awkward family photograph. Um, to start off, uh, just to say, one do welcome to Fremantle Arts Centre. My name is Glenn Isigan Pilkington. I am the curator of Fremantle Arts Centre, and I'm Ananda Yamaji and Yunga Man. Um, also, just to acknowledge the significance of this particular uh, edition of Disclosure. Um, for History is Calling. So Disclosure is a quarterly night of ideas and discourse, a space of ambition and experimentation. From art theory to contemporary identity, Disclosure presenters will share knowledge and experience from their own unique vantage points, challenging us to see the world through a different lens, if only for an evening. I would like to acknowledge that we have uh, Ingrid coming here tonight um, to do a welcome to country, to welcome us all to Wajak Noongar Buja. Ingrid is a Wajak Baladong Noongar woman from Walilup Fremantle and is recognised as a, a leader in the First Nations community. She is the founder and principal consultant of Karat Kurit Nguyen Consultancy, representing First Nations business globally for over 10 years, an alumni of Murdoch University and of Melbourne Business School. Ingrid is a fierce advocate for First Nations people and a regular here at Fremantle Arts Centre. And we're thrilled to have Ingrid here this evening to welcome all of you to Wajak Noongar Buja. Please welcome Ingrid to the stage. <laughs> or to the step. I'm going to sit here. <laughs> Hello, auntie. Kaya mum and yoga bal. Yau calling kopa da weirin. Dina ning yura ngang nuna wajan jang ko kopa da buja wa. Ngala mutang wa. Pretty good, eh? <laughs> like the Oscar speech, I'd like to thank, you know, my elders, my ancestors, past, present. Without them, my boy just couldn't sit there and do, do that. My wonderful families in which represented here tonight um, and to the beautiful community that's always supported Nyungar people here in Wayulup. We, we thank you and, and love you um, so very much for being here tonight, um, but being with us on the journey to reconciliation. So, um, come from the Collard, Ben El Shaw, Kick It, Garlet, Ninyet, yeah. Hume, Hume yeah. Big Mob, mainly Wajuk and Balladong, connections up to the north as well through the Maguires. Um, and I'm actually pretty lucky because I'm only 40, not yet, but <laughs> close, um, this year, and I get to do things like welcomes. And for a young fella, that's actually quite an intimidating kind of thing because you're wearing about 60,000 years on your shoulder that you need to do justice to every time, you know, you do welcomes. But um, I take it on with great pride um, and knowing I've got that support from elders like Annie Carroll up here and my family. So um, it's a big job but it's a one worth doing when you know how much it means. Just like how much it means to see so much of our Wajula brothers and sisters stand by us in this journey of the voice. Um, it must be weird, 1967, how their mob felt thinking something amazing might actually happen. And it was actually the modular fellas that voted for it. We never had it. So I'm pretty confident this time around we might just get where we need to be to see the change that we want to see in this beautiful nation hand in hand 
in that beautiful spirit of reconciliation. So heart is warmed to see you all here tonight and waited up on beautiful old father's country. Um, usually I sing, but instead I'm going to get you mob to do it with me. I'm going to teach you three words. And the ceremony is about celebrating coming together, um, which is what we're doing. Hopefully really doing it later this year. So, Karlak is the first word. Can you say Karlak? Kuling? And Wula. My old man says when Nunukut Wonga Ngang Da Nijamujipa, that there's a real power when you speak language. And it doesn't discriminate at all. Everyone gets to feel that sense of connection if you choose to step into that space. So, I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to get your mob to do it with me, and then we can get on with this panel. Ooh, you know you're getting old when you're making old fella noises like that. <laughs> Let's be honest, if this thing gets through, that's how it's going to go down, right? Sorry, your turn. Ready? I'll count you in. One, two, three, four. Now, don't make me use the pun. I want to hear your voice. Yeah? We're a fun mob us, aren't we? <laughs> Hopefully you feel this little tingle on your skin. They reckon that's the old fellas gently coming to say, oh, I hear you, I see you, thank you. Thank you so much for acknowledging us mob, our families and our journey. Connect with us, walk with us. And that's what it's all about. It's about all of us coming together to make that change. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for joining in ceremony here tonight. Um, Sorry I can't stick around, old boy's doing laps, uh, waiting to pick me up, so I've got to go. But <laughs> it's a long walk back to River Lake. So enjoy your night, enjoy being with each other, and let's uh, go forward together in this journey. Strong, proud, united. Thank you. That's my one. Thank you. Huh? Thank you, Ingrid. Um, I've written notes, but I kind of just want to freestyle maybe a little bit because this all seems a bit formal. Um, firstly, I just want to thank and acknowledge all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here tonight. Um, this conversation is happening kind of in our homes, in our offices, locker rooms for sport, not that I play any. Um, <laughs> But it's happening everywhere and we know that it's our responsibility to talk and to answer and to educate, but it doesn't make the burden of carrying this any lighter for any of us. So I just want to acknowledge you guys and anyone that's in the audience and our colleagues from the City of Fremantle who are here tonight, you know, like we are here passionate and committed to creating real change in this nation of ours and ensuring that we're all equal. Um, so yeah, if everyone can just put their hands together for all of us that are carrying that. And I will read these because these are the formalities. Um, firstly, just to acknowledge any elected members from the City of Fremantle who join us tonight and also to our Mayor, uh, Hannah Fitzharding. Um, we're really grateful to have your support as we walk together on this journey. Uh, also, just to acknowledge our supporters um, that make all of the work we do at the Arts Centre possible, so the Department of Local Government, Sports and Creative Industries through the Arts Organisations Investment Program, uh, the City of Fremantle for their continued support, and also for making this event and other events which focus on the voice possible through their investment in the campaign. Um, Speaking of which, for those of you interested in getting involved, uh, the city is seeking volunteers to work on sharing more information about The Voice through our Kitchen Conversation series. So if you're interested in being involved, there's a little marquee with our colleagues down on the left-hand side as you walk towards the gate. Um, please do pop by and, uh, yeah, and have a chat if you're keen on that. So tonight we convene at Walila, a place of great importance historically, both in a pre-invasion context, but also as the site of arrival and invasion when the British sailed their ships towards our shore. 
in 1827, almost 200 years ago. In the 200 years that have passed since then, we have seen unprecedented change to our family, to our culture, to our kin, to our country, to our languages. Um, and while I could talk extensively about the damage and the trauma that reverberates through generations into our children and our nieces and nephews who spend lives trying to understand this deep pain, I'm mindful that we're here to talk about the proposition of meaningful change for all of us together and for The Voice, to talk about The Voice. Um, you know, we need to be in a position where we can make decisions for our own selves, for our communities, for our country. Um, and we need to be in the rooms of influence where people have been making decisions about us without us. And that's what this conversation really is about. Um, as you all know, we'll be asked to participate in a referendum this year, and the referendum will ask the following question. A proposed law to alter the Constitution to recognise the First Peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve of this proposed alteration? This is what we'll be asked, and there are so many different points of view around this, making for challenging conversations around our First Nations history, our recent shared Australian history, and the capacity for positive change in our contemporary reality. We are mindful of the many opinions the voice um, conjures within our community and perhaps even within our audience joining us here tonight. At Fremantle Arts Centre, we are committed to creating culturally safe spaces so that I ask if anything you hear tonight stirs a response that we approach all of our interactions with each other, with the panel and with our fellow audiences with respect and care. And while conversations around The Voice ask us each to reflect and perhaps sit with our own discomfort, that we must be kind and con as we consider such a significant moment in our shared history. So that's why here, we're, we're here to unpack voice, the, this issue of The Voice through a panel bringing together cultural ambassadors, academics and emerging leaders to explore the legal, cultural and social complexities and benefits of a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament an ambition articulated through the Makarata, the Uluru Statement to the Heart in 2017, following the establishment of the Referendum Council and the national conversations that were undertaken with community. Tonight we have a, a panel of great minds um, who are here to share their thoughts and reflections about the voice to parliament. And our panel is comprised of, please put your hand up as I say these things, of our moderator, Emma Garlett. <laughs> uh, panelists include Auntie Carolinas, <laughs> friend and colleague, Dr. Stephen Gilchrist, <laughs> Sophie Coffin, <laughs> and Tyson McEwen. <laughs> and just a little reminder that through the advances of modern technology, we are also joined tonight by audiences at home as this event is being live streamed. Um, so very quickly, I just want to give you a bit more information about our moderator. Emma Garlett is a Noongar, Yamaji and Nupali, Nupali woman, writer, educator and advocate for First Nations people and is passionate about justice, law reform and ensuring First Nations people are involved in decisions which affect them. Emma has extensive experience working in academia, industry, media and as a lawyer. So I'd like to pass on to Emma, who will now introduce the rest of the panel. Um, and I just really hope that everyone takes tonight as an opportunity to listen, to really consider what these changes could mean for us and our families and our communities. Thank you, Emma. Good evening. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't happen again. Good evening, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you all tonight mm. to discuss an extremely important topic, the First Nations Voice to Parliament. My name is Emma Garlett and I have the absolute privilege to moderate the discussion of our brilliant panel you see before you today. Tonight, we will unpack what the Voice to Parliament is and what it means to our panellists. More practically, we'll delve into instances in the past which would have benefit benefited from having a voice to parliament and discuss what you can do as an Australian to be informed and educated about one of the most significant moments in Australian history, the upcoming referendum.
which aims to ensure Aboriginal people are recognised in the way they want to be recognised in the founding document of Australia, the Constitution. So tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel to you. Carol Innes is a co-director of an Aboriginal-led project, Danju Coolany, Walking Together. Carol is a mentor, consultant, board director and project manager. Carol is currently co-chair of Reconciliation WA and a board member of the Art Gallery of Western Australia. Carol has worked in a not-for-profit organisations, arts and cultural organisations, state and federal government agencies and Aboriginal controlled community organisations. Next up, we have Dr. Stephen Gilchrist. Dr. Gilchrist is a senior lecturer in the School of Indigenous Studies at the University of Western Australia. He's a writer and a curator who has worked with the Indigenous Australian collections of the National Gallery of Australia, the British Museum, the National Gallery of Victoria, and the Hood Museum of Art. Stephen has curated numerous exhibitions in Australia and the United States, and has written extensively on Indigenous art from Australia. Our next panellist is Sophie Coffin, who is a lawyer from the Pilbara. Sophie holds a Bachelor of Arts in Law and Indigenous Studies and a Juris Doctor from UWA. She is currently the Principal Associate to Chief Justice Quinlan at the Supreme Court. Sophie is a WA Youth Representative of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And our last panellist tonight here is Tyson McEwen. Tyson is from the Pilbara region of WA and recently graduated from his law degree at UWA and he's currently a graduate at a Perth law firm. Now, before we get into the questions, um, I'd like all the panellists just to say who your mob is and where you're from to start. Thank you, Emma. My family are Wajak, um, or Noongar, Wajak Baladong, um, Wilman and... Uh, just trying to think. Bal yeah, Baladong. So that's my family, my Noongar family. But we also have um, an English family that um, when we're thinking about this whole change, we need to acknowledge the, the other parts of our family and our family history, which is, um, you know, through um, the change that happened here in Australia at the time, we ha do have to acknowledge that we do have English family as well. And, you know, for my um, father and mother, and um, their great-grandparents came from, in from the English uh, um, settlement or, you know, in our context we could say invasion but it's our family so when I think about where we are now it's time for us to think start thinking about who we really are as Australians so I've got a big broad family and I acknowledge all of them thanks uh, hi Emma I'm Stephen Gilchrist from the Yamaji people of the Ingata language group northwest western Australia and also have family on, on my mother's side and on my, my father's side um, I've British from the UK, yep. Hi everyone, I'm Sophie. I'm from the Pilbara, as mentioned, and on my mum's side, I'm Nyongamara, and that's in the Pilbara area. And on my dad's side, I'm in Jibundi and Bolku, and that's around Marble Bar, Mulga Downs area. Originally from uh, South Headland, um, Karyata from South Headland, and then in the Broome Way is the Bari people on my, uh, Oh, thank you. Just everyone that has read the Uluru Statement from the heart, can you please raise your hand? So most people, I was considering whether I should read it out to you or not, but it seems like most people have read the Uluru Statement from the heart. Um, so I think we'll get on to the panel discussion next. So you would all know that if you've read the Uluru Statement from the heart, it's a very powerful document. It's something that was put together in 2017. And the voice to parliament is the first step in implementing the Uluru Statement from the heart. So to our panellists, what does the voice to parliament mean to you? So maybe we'll start with um, Soph, if you don't mind. Sure. <laughs> uh, to me, it means having a say in decisions that affect our lives. Um, and historically, we haven't. And as was mentioned by Glenn before, and is a term in Indigenous uh, research and academia, decisions are made about us without us. Um, and that's across the board in health, education, the criminal justice system, land management, 
absolutely everything that affects our lives has historically excluded our point of view. And we, I acknowledge that we have a lot of social issues in communities and the best way to address those is through solutions that come from our own communities, uh, ourselves. And research also shows that they're the most effective. So to give a quick example, uh, there are programs overseas where um, juvenile offenders are, um, instead of being sentenced to a youth detention centre, they're sent to spend time in community with their elders and reconnect to culture, and that shows uh, better rates of reducing reoffending. And something like that has also been successful here, but it's not widespread because we haven't historically had a say in the government decisions that dictate uh, those programs. So, in short, it's about having a say in every aspect of our lives, as I think we have the right to. Yeah, thanks, So <laughs> Completely agree. Um, Stephen, do you have anything you would like to add to that as well? What does a voice to parliament mean to you? Yeah, well, for me, the voice to parliament is really about recognition and representation. So I think it's really important that, you know, we understand that the, the great antiquity of this continent, but we also have to understand the great wisdom that can be channeled in really important ways. Um, I think you know many of the solutions that have been um, given to, well, you know, handed down to Indigenous people have been insufficient. And so, what this voice to Parliament does is to, you know, it's not exactly a radical concept. You know, it's an advisory body, and governments use advisory bodies all the time. Um, you know, what is radical, I think, is that it will be peopled by Indigenous peoples who um, have the knowledge and expertise to um, deploy this local knowledge in ways that are, you know, can be transformational and meaningful um, to communities. Um, you know, I must admit that I wasn't altogether energised by the constitutional recognition campaign a number of years ago. And I've been thinking, well, what did that indifference do? What did that resistance do? And it achieved absolutely nothing. Um, and so, you know, for me, I want to be part of something that is positive, you know, can have a change. Um, and I also, you know, the voice to parliament means something to me because of my family. Um, you know, thinking about having a voice and having a voice that is listened to. Um, and thinking about the people who came before me who didn't have the luxury of this question. Absolutely. Um, Arnie Carroll, do you, would you ha what does the voice to parliament mean to you? I think it, for me it means um, a big part of um, recognition, finally, in the rule book of the nation. And I've been saying that because we have been excluded. Um, we've been spoken about, spoken for and spoken to. But we've never had the opportunity to have our voices heard in ways that the ownership is back on the, our people. Um, there's a number of, uh, when I think about this, whilst we've had a lot of negativity, the most powerful thing that we have had is the strength of our resilience, of who we are, that we can all stand up and say where we are and where we come from. So we have survived against the odds. And I think that's the big part of um, the change that I'd like to see. And I think through this voice, it allows us not to be washed away at the whim of the power of government at the time. And we've seen too much of that in the past. And when I think about the 1967 referendum, I wasn't included as a, a human being when I was born. Many of the other members of the panel have been a part of the change that all people have fought for then. And some of them said, we wished we had asked for more. This referendum will be a part of that, that change that recognises us finally as the first peoples of this nation. However it will work out, it will still happen with government and with us. And I think that's the important part of this, is that we have an opportunity for every single one of us to change a dark history that kept us away from celebrating we were the first peoples of this country. 
it is very important to remember the history and everything that we've been through and that our elders have fought for. Um, Tyson? Yeah, why the voice? Um, for me, I think about it's the, for community voices and at a local and a regional level. You know, we are politicians or um, associates like that, you know, they have their own their interest or their party alignment, even though they might come from a particular region. So I think it's an opportunity for First Nations com uh, uh, communities to actually have their local leaders fight for them and fight for, for their interests. And it's really about, um, you know, community knows what works. There's nothing new. We've been saying it to government over time with reports and submissions. And so, and what the, the voice does as well, it, it doesn't, it's, it's just not the umbrella where it's like, all right, we've got the voice and um, all the communities are exactly the same. It's not like that. And I think that's one of the issues that we're trying to say is that the regional and local voices will be able to speak to their issues and concerns and allows the space for you know, for other communities to do the same as well. And I think it's not asking for too much. And I think it's a genuine <coughs> invitation to the Australian people to be like, we know what would work, so why don't you, you back us in this time? It is true. And we're at a time now where there's a lot of Indigenous members in Parliament, but people need to remember that they represent their electorate. They don't represent the Indigenous communities in which they're working. So the local, the regional voices and a federal voice to Parliament, it really makes sure that we address that gap there. And we actually have First Nations voices come through the pipeline from a local level. Absolutely complete. Couldn't agree with you more. So the next question I have for the panel is, why is it important that we constitutionally enshrine the voice to parliament as opposed to only having statutory based voice to parliament models? So, um, yeah, whoever would like to start. We have a couple of lawyers on the panel. <laughs> oh, not yet, disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer yet. <laughs> this has been recorded, so no, no lawyer. Um, oh yeah, I could go. Um, so I'm no constitutional law expert, but in my understanding and opinion is that uh, if you have a legislative voice, that uh, the you know that's an act of the government of the day, where by tomorrow a new government can get rid of it, and we've seen that. Or if they don't want to get rid of it, they want to put more red tape. They want to punish the body and they'll cut funding and then they lose employment. And where if it's a federal level, you know, you can't get that because it's the double majority and that's the act of the Australian people. And that's why it's so hard for government to get rid of it. Um, and then more of a, a side note is that, um, you know, in the Constitution, Section 109, you don't have to go to it, but, um, you know, there's the inconsistent law part there, which states that if a state law or a territory law is in, um, inconsistent with the federal law, then the federal law will prevail. So what I see with that and the state governments that are almost doing their own voice to parliament or the treaty decisions, they're almost waiting for the federal government to catch up because if they do anything, the federal government can just act upon it and then potentially their state law is almost vetoed from that. So that's why we need the constitutionally enshrined voice. I totally agree uh, with Tice. We used to have ATSIC, which some people might remember, and that was a bit before my time, but that was the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. And the purpose of that was like a voice where it was an advisory body, but that was based in statute, which meant that it didn't really have legs in the sense that the government of the day could just get rid of it. And that's what happened. It was just abolished. 
uh, and then it kind of leaves us all without a representative body. So since then there really hasn't been anything like that. And this voice is going to be constitutionally enshrined, hopefully, which would give it legs and mean that it doesn't matter what government is in, our rights will always be standing, we will always have a say in matters that affect us. And I don't think it's fair that our rights and interests are dependent on something so volatile as the government of the day. No, thank you. I would also... Please clap. <laughs> Yeah, I would also add that these advisory bodies have existed, you know, under Holt, Whitlam, Fraser, Howard, Howard abolished ATSIC. Um, and so, yeah, part of the attraction of the voice to parliament is its permanency um, and, you know, how we can have security with this permanency. But I also think we have to, um, yeah, think about what the limitations are of the constitution as well. You know, when did our dreams get so small that we're so focused on this document that is limiting, it still has, you know, prejudice within it, you know, it still lists the king as the head of state. So, you know, it's not the only thing that we need to change, um, but it does give some legal permanency to enshrining this voice to parliament. And I think that's, you know, hugely important. Um, and that we we can think about what more we can add to this document. Mm. Um, you know, I think, you know, many of us have struggled with, you know, her not heroicising this document, but thinking that this document was the same instrument that dispossessed Aboriginal people and now is supposed to be the same instrument that um, recuperates some of our sovereignty. But this forestalled sovereignty is not the same thing as a forfeited sovereignty, you know. Um, and so when we're thinking about the voice to parliament, we have to think about the question that is being posed to us as well. Um, sometimes we might want more than the question is asking, but we have to be responsive to what that question is. Thanks, Steve, Tyson and... Um, sorry. Um, I was... In ATSIC. I remember ATSIC. I worked for ATSIC. So it, for me, it's like a um, how much more do we have to go through as a nation to not rightfully recognise the most resilient, longest living cultures of the world, uh, our people, in the rule book of the nation that we can celebrate more meaningful than just having a welcome to country at your event or go on country for a cultural immersion or have a lovely Aboriginal elder come and do something great in your school or your organisation. This has to be something that brings us together as a nation. The world is watching us. The world is watching us. Australia has to grow up. And guess what, Stephen? It's written for the king of the day now. <laughs> so for me, I think... As someone who watched programs be diminished through even through the ATSIC time when the change was happening, we were getting less and less. It gave an opportunity for our people to stand strong and be proud of where they were coming from, from regional centres, coming to metropolitan centres, advocating for change that we wanted to see and be a part of, but celebrating who we are collectively. We are diverse in our own people, but we are a part of a great place, a place you and all of us have called home. So I think what we have to do is there needs to be a change in the rules. And that rule book only happened in 1901. So we have lived too long under a false law. And if it wasn't for Marbo, and we've just celebrated Marbo day just recently and we had his daughter and grandson here with the ATSIS conference at the Aboriginal Institute of Torres Strait Islander Studies here in Perth just recently. We had over 900 people, nearly a thousand people in Perth, more online. We hosted that celebrating survival of country, looking to how we can build prosperity for our people through native title and it was a limited space. Native title was limited for our people. We don't have 
the beauty of what the Land Rights Act of the Northern Territory. So we are set up against each other anyway. But this time of the country, we need to come together and get something right. And we need you, all of you, to be a part of that with us. So now you all know why we need it to be constitutionally enshrined. What I'd like to ask the panel next is, say we have the referendum, the referendum passes, we have a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament. What happens now practically? So how will the voice to parliament improve the lives of First Nations people in Australia? Uh, Stephen, would you like to go first? Well, I'm trained as an art historian and we're not known for being completely practical, but <laughs> I do think that, you know, I, I um, you know, my mum always says to me to close the gap, we have to get in the gap. Um, and, you know, we have to understand the gap. Um, we have to understand the local on the ground problems. Um, and I think for me, this is essentially what the, the voice does. You know, it offers, it increases the diversity of representation to Parliament to ensure that you know the best um, we we not that we have um, this representation to government in order to make changes for our communities that we deem necessary for ourselves, um, and so you know I think it's an important symbolic inclusion into the constitution. And the constitution really is a document of principles. You know, it doesn't have, I've started to read it, I couldn't get through the whole thing. Um, but, you know, it's about principles. You know, what are the principles that we want? What are the values that we hold dear? Um, and so for me, I think it is about um, the symbolic aspect, but also this hugely practical um, element as well. Um, you know, what can it achieve? You know, we don't know yet because we are going to be the architects of this voice. Um, you know, we can have a say that we haven't had this say before. Um, and it's not just having the voice, it's having the voice listened to. Um, and so having that constitutional protection that we've been talking about is, um, you know, essential. I can, I can go. Um. <laughs> I'll make uh, my answer will be in two parts. I think the first part is for a young person, and even though, you know, once the referendum is passed, hopefully that, you know, it's it's not going to end all these issues and, the, um, you know, it's going to be a silver bullet. And we know that. But it's a, a good, um, you know, start to that. And I do believe that the voice will, you know, enable more young people to actually have the hope and ambitions to do what they do because, you know, coming from uh, Port Hedden and Geraldton as well, there was a lot of smart people I went to school with, but they just didn't, wasn't a big fan of um, the Perth, especially in this weather. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, it. so I think The Voice can definitely, in, you know, increase more regional people to do um, some some great things, which they, all, they already are. And part two of my answer is what the, um, you know, the concept of a voice, and I think of it, it's it's just more the concept, you know, the Uluru stem from heart is saying, you know, we want a voice, want a voice, and then over, you know, the six years that it's happened that the government has created this proposal and um, creating this voice concept. And I've written down some of the things that I thought from the an amendment, which is um, quite important, is when they say it it may make representations to the parliament or executive. It's not saying it's it's you know it's not compelling the body to do something. It's saying they may do it, and when um, the government doesn't think that they don't need to do it, they can do it. You know, they don't have to sit around and wait for the government to go, hey, can you do some more research into this and that? They could already be there because the voice is the, f you know, the fact-based evidence of the body that can advise the um, executive and the parliament. 
Um, and lastly, I think that the voice will. Um, sorry, I've just I've just lost myself here. You know, it can present it. It um, you know the current uh, concept of the government is um, you establish a committee, then you appoint the elected members. Um, you know they can um, conduct an inquiry, the public hearings. They uh, they get their submissions. Uh, they draft a report, submit a report with recommendations, and then the government either decides to fully um, take in the recommendations or part of it. What the voice does, it breaks all that up. It just it it's it's just not another uh, clog in the chain. It could happen at the you know at the beginning before the submissions are happening, even before the joint committee is selected. So. You know, when people say it's controversial, it's it's not. It's just a different way on how the government will handle government issues. I think when I think about what it will do, it's important to think about how it will work. So there are 12 design principles um, that have been designed by the Uluru Statement and the Referendum Working Committee um, in consultation with communities, it's been very thorough. And one of those is that the voice in its recommendations to government, if the government doesn't take those on, they will have to provide reasons why and those will have to be uh, publicly available. And so that level of accountability is something we've never had before because, like, there have been so many royal commissions, example, into Aboriginal deaths in custody. And then there are 200 or so recommendations but it just gets chucked away in a filing cabinet and there's no accountability. So why spend all these resources and go through all this trauma to make recommendations for the government from our people when they don't actually have to read them or give reasons why? Um, and that is a generalisation. Maybe some are uptaken, but generally there's not a really strong accountability from the government. So this body will give that accountability and that just lets the public know why decisions are being made without input or without. Um, and the other part of it is that something that the voice will do, not just for the lives of Aboriginal people, but it will bring together the rest of Australia because I think it's a true spirit of reconciliation if the rest of the country wants to walk together with us and do something that will substantially improve our lives. So, yeah. Thank you, Sophie. And I think I would hope if it gets up, I think we'll probably um, fill the rivers, the lakes with tears because it's been too long. And I think when I, in 2008, when Kevin Rudd made his apology to the Stolen Generation people and for those elders that were lucky enough to be able to be in the parliament when he said that, they got to hear it. Many didn't survive long afterward, but they got to hear it from the prime minister of the country. What we need to think about is this being, is that Australia speaks. Australia speaks with our heart and mind connected for the change that we need to see. And I think we've been dodging this for too long and we can't be at the whim of government for us as a people anymore. We have been held back with barriers in, rather, in round prosperity for our nation. We haven't even been considered in how we become an economic powerhouse. Even when native title was in play in 1991, 92, 93, the fight that Eddie Marbo fought that he never got to see for terra nullis to be wiped out. We were here first. My old people were here walking this country before the boats came. It's a true history. We have to make the change together. 
Many of our elders never had a voice. Many of our elders were held to the whim of acts, legislation and policies that kept us from being even surviving on the lands of which they were born. It's time for a change. Time for a change for Australia to be grown up and recognise there were First Nations people here and to understand that we are more than just Aboriginal people. We are people of many nations ourselves. The panellists here tonight shared that with you. The diversity amongst our people and our voices is different. But we are unified in recognition. We are unified in respect and we are unified in the knowledge that we have to offer. And I think it's time for that opportunity when Emma talked about the acknowledgement, being acknowledged in the rule book of the nation, it's time enough. And Emma, I wonder if I could just add that we've seen this fear mongering before. You know, we saw it with Marbo, we saw it with Mi with Wick, we saw it with the National Apology. Um, you know, we're not going to be scared. So we've heard from the panelists how they will think the voice to parliament will help. So what I'd like to ask the panellists next is, and we've touched on this briefly, is what, what has happened in the past or any instances in the past where a voice to parliament would have helped First Nations people? I can think of a number. You've mentioned it now with having deaths in custody. There's been a number of times that a voice to parliament may have improved or changed the outcome of decisions that affected Aboriginal people. But I'd like to ask the panellists, what really comes to mind for you when thinking, wow, if we had a voice to parliament, that wouldn't have happened in the past? So maybe we'll start with um, Annie Carroll. I think there's been too many. <laughs> I, I just think about all those people, those I mean, even to get up, um, I think the generosity of spirit of people coming to tonight, I want to acknowledge all of you, I think that's special. But I, I, when you work inside of a system and you're hearing from your elders what you want, they want to see when you have gone on consultation. I mean, I was here in the Perth consultation before the Uluru meeting on the 27th of May, 2017. We've had many historic moments. We're talking about Barunga Statement just recently where the Honourable Linda Burney was there just last week. All of this becomes a part of what government had the power to shift. And the promises that were made and never kept. And the fight that our people who still lived on country were fighting for, for change. So I, I think there's a... It's like a, I don't want to plead for this. I think it's just the right thing to do. We've got to do something right. We're not just deadly sportsmen or deadly academics like these, more. <laughs> we are people connected to this place for millennia. You and where your family come from, whether are here or overseas, imagine if this happened to you. That's what we want to appeal to you. Because we're now appealing to the human spirit, connecting your hearts and minds. That how would you feel if this happened to you? And we have had it. 
through wartime over and over. And this happened to us in peacetime. So when I think about why this is really important, I remember saying, I'm fighting for my kids. I don't want to fight for my grandkids. Guess what? I'm a grandmother of 11, still fighting for a change that we become recognised as contributors for social, cultural, environmental and economic change. And we've done that over and over. We led those explorers to the water for survival. We helped build pathways for food source. That's what this is about. We need to recognise that. Our beautiful Swan River that we have got, our old people cared for that. And this is where it started, up the river. So if you're talking with your family, just educate, understand and listen. Because, like I said, it's time. Yeah, I think we can't keep doing the same thing and expect different outcomes. So, you know, for me, this is an opportunity to do something different. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's very powerful. And I think my answer to your question is all of the decisions would have been different and they would have been better if there had been you know some increased representation increased expertise increased lived experience of what it means to be in these situations and so you know we're still having to have um you know negotiating things like land rights and like death from custody um, you know, treaty and sovereignty, they, these are all things that are being negotiated right now. Um, and so we need to channel all of this incredible generational intelligence, ancestral wisdom um, onto some of the most difficult issues of our time. But, you know, we can't in such a wealthy country like Australia accept any more, um, you know, the you know, the socio-economic indicators for Aboriginal people, you know, this is not good enough. It needs to be changed. And, you know, if we have this particular lever to pull, we should pull it. I completely agree with what's been said as well. Um, and the only thing I would add is to think about the situation as it is now and has been for so many years in the Closing the Gap campaign you can see the statistics are terrible and they never get better and we have people living in third world conditions in our communities and we have the highest suicide rates in the entire world which is a crazy to think about when we have such a developed country and i think that having some kind of input from our own communities can only do something to help that will go a long way and I did have something else, but now I've forgotten it, so I'll turn to Tyson. Thanks, Stephen and Anna Carol for that. No, I think as a young person, you know, we've we've grown up and we've heard, we've seen, we've read the stories. I know my time at uni, you know, you um, whether it was for assignments or um, your tutorial readings, you know. Um, you think about the material you have to read and, you know, you see a common theme and, you know, so I know we can't change the past part, you know, the, we're moving forward, we kind of know what we have to do. And when I think about what we could benefit from, I think of our, you know, I think of, um, you know, as a young Australian, you know, I think of our, our national identity and uh, I always think about it when um you know the tragic event happened we were took on george and that was like the first time that a you know a significant site you know got media attention and um you know the mainstream media were talking about this significance of it 
but you know the you know the traditional owners said yes of course it's significant and so for me with the national identity what i think about is you know it's it's not us and you or it's not us and the other or us and them you know the i think of these um significant sites even all around as our you know is our significant sites and the traditional owners or you know that particular community is looking after it for the australian people to you know for waiting for them to finally realize that you know this is yours as well you know we're not this is not ours and i'm hoping that the voice can you know is that element of um bringing us together as a nation to actually being like you know what you're looking after is you know it's for all of us it's just not for one of us thank you Tyson um it's we don't want to be hypocritical you can't talk about truth telling and reconciliation and still keeping ignoring us that's where we have to change when i think about the conversations, the work that we do, every single day we get up to to make shift. Look at the lawyers we have here, historian, the educator, talking through, talking about us. And it's great that we can stand up and deliver that for us. But how about you also telling that story as well? The truth telling that we have to, del to consider as this nation is really a sorry and sad history. We are dealing with it. Every single day, we talk about generational trauma. We talk about stolen generation that many people don't want to acknowledge. But it happened. Our people were moved off country for development. Drukhan Gorge was not only one. How many of you people live in the southwest here? Imagine what we had before these houses when buildings were built on. Jook and Gorge has been happening since 1829 in Western Australia. Everywhere. More in the southwest region because of the accessibility when the first settlers came through. We live in it every single day. These buildings that were built from the sand, the budja of our country came from our country. Some of our old people may have even cut it up. So when you think about where this takes us, not just us as Aboriginal people, but all of us as Australians, let us take us into the future for a change and have a celebration of a new Australia for all of us. Wow, thank you all for those powerful responses. Now we have a yes campaign and a no campaign and a lot of Australians sit there and they're not too sure what to vote. There's information out there, they can attend forums like this which provide Indigenous perspectives. But to the panellists, what would you say um, or any advice that you would get for people that are sitting on the fence and they're not sure what to vote for the upcoming referendum. We do it every time we go to vote. <laughs> every time we go to vote, we don't know all the detail about all the people. We've had people go on and be elected into parliament and told lies. Then they got moved out quickly enough. But where was the scrutiny around that that's happening around what we're trying to go through? So I think there is a yes and no. And no also can also be a part of the power base that some Aboriginal people may have of being the only people who will always provide their alternative view for some. We're trying, the voice becomes a collective across many places. And I think that's really important. The voice for all of us takes us into the remote, into the regional and into the urban settings. And that's what we want to see. We had that a little bit with ATSIC where people were voted in by their regions. They were representing their regions. They provided across a number of different areas. 
It's not hard. And they were all working to guidelines and procedures. They still need to be developed with us. I would encourage people to talk to one another, um, to attend events like this, um, reread the Uluru Statement from the Heart, um, you know, memorise a paragraph. You know, how does it sit with you? How does it sit in your body? Um, it wasn't addressed to Parliament. It wasn't addressed to constitutional lawyers. It was addressed to the Australian public. Um, and so how are you going to answer that invitation? Um, you know, read it, spend time with it, listen to the words, you know, let it seep into your consciousness. Um, you know, there's there's a power in those words um, and there's a future in those words. And a hope. And a hope. Yeah. Want to clap me? I think we should clap. <laughs> I think um, for people who are sitting on the fence, I would encourage you to think about like the same-sex marriage plebiscite. That was a time when a lot of us had to vote on something substantial for a long time. And for me, that was an issue that didn't impact me directly. But of course, I voted yes, because if there is something that will improve substantially the lives of a lot of people or just one person even, I would want that for them. And I did want that. So that's why I voted yes. And for something like this, if you're thinking, well, I'm not Aboriginal, is it going to adversely affect me? No. If it's going to positively affect a whole other group of people, wouldn't you want that? For those people and to have some autonomy and self-determination and uh, take back a bit of self-control in the sense of having control over matters that affect us. And the other part of it is that there is 80, over 80% 80 agreement amongst Aboriginal people that we support this. And that's not just from leaders or people in the media, that's across the board, across the country. And if you wait for 100%, nothing gets done. And that's why nothing's ever been done up until this point. Because people have kept waiting and, you know, listening to people on the fringes who will, as mentioned, always argue the alternative. So that's a very strong majority. And I think it's really important to think about that. And I know that I've spoken to some people who have said, well, I went to a rally and now I think I'm supposed to vote no. And that's not true that that's just one person's perspective and we're not all going to agree amongst Aboriginal people because we are a group of people. People have different opinions but there's 80% majority so I think it's important to remember that. I think I was going to say is that you know when we're, we're not going to be telling you how to vote but I would like to remind everyone is as long as you make an informed vote, I think that's the important part because you don't want to be at the end of the day and just to, to give a vote just because you heard it from Bob's place down the road. So, you know, you really want to... And, and a part of the, the referendum process or any voting process is to start these conversations. Even the, the tough conversations, you, you actually... I know you might be able to learn about something about someone else. It could be a new topic that you haven't spoken to about anyone, you know, and f and for yourself that might uh, spark a new interest or a new hobby that you might have, or you might even make a new friend. So I think this whole process of a referendum is to actually have these conversations. So when it comes to the day that you have a um, informed decision, whether you say yes or no. And I think that's the most enjoyable thing living here um, you know, in Australia. Can I just add a quick thought? Sorry. Um, I think as well something to remember is that this isn't new and it wasn't just made up in the last year. This referendum is the culmination of decades, decades, even centuries of advocacy and hard work and people before our time, our ancestors and elders. And 
I think some people have a misconception that it's new and rushed and, you know, just a political item, but actually this is a really big deal and it's been um, the result of years and years of tireless work and our elders are tired and it's been a really long time so we really want this to be successful because we're losing our elders and they've fight it, been fighting this battle their whole lives and they've never been able to see the result. So... And another important consideration could also be to see how Australia will look internationally if the referendum doesn't po pass compared to other countries which have a lot of Indigenous rights, New Zealand, Canada, Nordic countries. We're really behind. And like it was mentioned earlier, the world is watching. And what would it mean if it doesn't pass? Why? Like, what does that say about Australia? So I have one last question for the panellists and we will open it up for questions from all the audience members. So start having a think about if you have any questions, there'll be a microphone that will go around. So the last question I have for our panellists tonight is, how can Australians best support the referendum campaign if they're here tonight and they've listened and now they, they're convinced or they want to do something because they realise, okay, this is really important and I want to help. How can they best do that? I'm happy to start. Um, I would say it goes back to what Tice was saying before, having conversations with people, um, dispelling the myths that people might think and you, like making decisions based on fact and having conversations based on fact. And you can still have opinions, but it's important that you're referring to the facts and you can get those from the uluru.org Uluru website. Um, and it's got everything about the statement that you'd need to know and answers to all kinds of questions. So I think um, uh, as allies, which I would consider everyone here, when you go out and have these conversations, you're really helping us as First Nations people because we can't talk to everyone. And we go to events like this and it's it can be a lot for us and quite emotionally draining. So... For you to go forward and have those conversations, I think that's really important and such a great way to support us and the referendum. I just feel a little bit exhausted. Um, I'm thinking about three generations that I, I care for the fourth being my parents, but we're not here to see this, but we're in a part of the dismissal of who they are as Australians. My grandparents, great-grandparents. So when I think about this process um, and the pain and the trauma of our people that's been caused through racism, the Constitution is probably this thick. Have any of you read it? The detail that people are looking for will come in piles and piles of paper, which is part of every other piece of what's in the Constitution. So what people are asking for is an unrealistic ask. It will happen with us together the change so for me it's about what has already been said inform yourselves more read through the statement because this constitutional change is only one element of what was asked for the Uluru statement the voice to parliament the truth telling and treaty all of that is to come. Going down this pathway, the truth-telling we could come together quickly on is that we've done a bad job so far and we all have to have responsibility for that because of who we voted for. <laughs> and we can't change all of that. But we can look to a new horizon. I wanted to sleep until the 1st of January 2024 
So it was all over. I don't know what I would do if no gets up. I don't know what I would do. I've heard people say they'll leave the country because they can't afford to. We can't. This is our home. And some of us have been moved off our home through legislation, acts and policies. Some people have been denied their identity through legislation, acts and policy. The rule book of this nation will give us the acknowledgement and recognition that we deserve. So for all the grandmothers, all the grandfathers, all the mothers and the fathers, the voices who've never heard, we hope and make a change for them and for my grandchildren to walk tall about who they are. That's all I want to see. Carol gave me my first job in the arts. It wasn't the job I wanted. <laughs> I didn't get it, but it was the job I needed. And she invested in me. And we are doing this work, and we would like to see a return on that investment. Um, for me, I'm an educator. Um, you know, for me, education has been a huge part of the reconciliation movement. Um, you know, education can be utterly transformational and you know I have this wonderful opportunity to be in the front row when I'm teaching you know predominantly young people about the history of this place and they have this intense curiosity and they have this immense openness um, and I get to see them develop their political consciousness to kind of step into their political ancestral power and you know this is amazing um, and so you know I all of this happens because they are reading the right things um, they're having guided conversations um, you know they're talking amongst themselves they're being critically reflective about what's important um, to them you know it's absolutely not my job to tell them what to do but to give them the, t the tools to think critically about what's important what they're being exposed to um, you know if I did tell them what to think that would be very boring for them and very boring for me as well but we get to offer them this amazing history of this place you know from an indigenous perspective indigenous philosophies um, and you know this absolute value in what they're learning and you know all I can really do as a teacher is demonstrate my own commitment to learning you know perpetual learning perpetual growth um, you know to pose question after question and I think this is what we need to do as well um, you know if we thought the same way that we did you know five ten years ago you know what a waste of a decade what a waste of our kind of human potential. Um, you know, I think the best way to support the referendum is to talk, um, you know, have conversations, um, you know, be present for one another, um, share your own journey with others. You know, what have you taken from these discussions, from listening to people? Um, and share this with other people, you know, meet people where they are, you know, share um, your own process, you know, understand their confusion, their reservations, um, but tell your own story. How did you arrive at your decision? Um, you know, wear a badge. I can see a few badges here. Um, buy a T-shirt, you know, start a book club. Um, you know, read those fact sheets, you know, there's so much information at our disposal right now. Um, and, you know, don't be indifferent to this process. You know, it's not, as you can tell, a dispassionate process for Indigenous people. It's, you know, hugely um, emotional. Um, and don't be a bystander, you know, in 
complicated and unequal ways we all become this story of place and we have an opportunity to offer a new story to restore this place and you know that feels very powerful and that feels very um beautiful to be able to tell a new narrative so we have to be able to you know meet this moment um what that moment means to you and understand the history of this moment understand the years of activism and of advocacy um of blood sweat and tears um you know think about wick and marbo and the stolen generations um you know that's all part of this particular historical moment um because this is also your story as well so be energized by the challenge um be courageous um be present um you know be principled um knowledge isn't something um to be hoarded it's something to be shared so you know share this knowledge share your story and you know share this predicament of what it means to share this space yeah ve olori time from heart was really an invitation to the australian people and how you can support the movement is you know is what you're doing right now is is being in the room being active and listening and and sometimes that is enough just to be in the room so then when you do leave the room you know you can tell people your experience because that's what you know life's all about is about experiences and uh you know for me this referendum will be my first referendum so you know i think about but when i you know i went to optus um i can't say who i go for cuz i'm not playing well eagles um <laughs> but you know when i take family from up north to optus and it's their first afl game and they just in awe of the experience and i feel like that's what i kind of want to challenge you guys here tonight is when i don't know if you've done a um you know they even 1999 referendum but you know think about those people in your community that it's their first referendum so how can you influence or have an impact on their experience that it's you know because it is a a generational event with a, a referendum so you want them to be talking about it forever and if you can have an impact on that wouldn't that be something so special So now we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Um so is there someone with a oh, there's someone with a mi microphone at the back. So if you have a question, um please just raise your hand and say where you're from and um who your question is directed at or if it's for anyone to answer. Um we don't bite, we're friendly. going to ask a question I'm just going to make an observation which I always hate at these things but as I was sitting here listening it occurred to me that perhaps the best illustration of why we need a voice to parliament is the process of constitutional recognition to date the process up until early 2023 was first nations led like and it was amazingly positive the uluru statement from the heart was first nations led the constitutional uh amendment working group was first nations led and support the port was overwhelming among australians up until the beginning of 2023 and then it hit the floor of parliament and the usual bullshit began uh, it, it turned into a political issue uh race baiting began dog whistling began people started flying into indigenous communities and verbaling them to the media uh people started telling indigenous people 
you know, there hasn't been enough consultation. Let us answer the question for you. And it's working because sadly across Australia, support for constitutional recognition <laughs> is wavering. And to my mind, that's just such a good example of why we need a voice to parliament because if we leave it to Canberra, it will be <laughs> political issues being dealt with as political issues are always dealt with and rather than having these successful Indigenous-led, community-led proposals uh, getting up, we'll have politician, politicians doing what they have always done to date. Thank you. Did any... I, I think he gave us some leeway. He said it was a comment, not a question. So we agree. <laughs> um, to all of you, thank you very much. I'm going to direct my question, I think, to Sophie and Stephen. Uh, because, Stephen, I don't understand um, the... Um, can, what the, you worded it well, I remembered it until we had that interaction. I don't understand the reservations of the people who are opposed to this. And Sophie, what are the reasons for nearly 20% of people, and I think maybe Aborigines, who would say no to this? Um, thank you for the question. I would just want to point out the language as well that we don't use that word. We use Aboriginal people. Um, that word is kind of harking back to the colonial policies of the past. And I don't know the answer as to why people aren't in support in that 20%. Things that I've heard is that people feel they weren't consulted. But I know for a fact that, as I've said, it was the widest, most thorough consultation process that there's ever been of Aboriginal people and as has been mentioned and like what a lot of people know is that there are so many there are 250 language groups so very diverse people and of course everyone has different needs different realities uh, and faces different issues and issues in common so it's been very hard to get a consensus and the government says well you never tell us what you want or it's always different or you, we don't know so we're just going to put it over there this is the first time where everyone's come together and it is the consensus. And for those people in the 20%, I think we can also safely say that often it's people who will always argue in the alternative, whether that's for media attention, whether that's just for general attention, e.g. at a rally in Perth, which I've seen. So that's my response to that. I can't give you an exact answer. Thank That's okay. I think Thank you, so. and for correcting me. Thanks. I think some of the reservations in the no campaign is really about the order in which things go. So, you know, we have Senator Thorpe saying that we need treaty before voice and things like that. So, um, you know, I would say that that's not the question that's being put forward to the Australian public. The question that we're asked is about, um, yeah, representation, increasing representation to parliament. Um, you know, we might want a different question, but that's not the question that we're being asked to um, answer. Um, and so, you know, I think the voice doesn't preclude treaty negotiations at all. In fact, they're happening right now. They could ha happen, they could take a long time. They could take 20 years. Um, you know, people in our families don't have 20 years. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we understand that you know, Indigenous people haven't ceded sovereignty of the place now termed Australia. Um, and so this isn't a discussion about whether or not sovereignty will be dissolved by being included in the Constitution. You know, that's not what this is about. But I think some people are attaching that question to the voice question. And if I could comment as well on the order, because I agree that that's why some people are against it. But actually it's been drafted in this way for a reason, so that you have the voice first, so that that can oversee the truth-telling and the treaty-making processes that will follow. It's not that they're not going to happen. We need that advisory and voice established with legs, as mentioned, so that it can oversee these processes to come. Yeah. And just... 
the truth telling is not from us to you, it's from you to us as well. And also because a big part of um, the process that we, we're going to be going through is dissecting the policies that cause this. So we've got to, it's, and a lot of that's to do with government. The government and churches had control and the police had control over us for so many years. So this truth telling that people um, think that it's us telling our stories, it's not. It's stories of the nation. And it's horrible stories of the nation. So I think that's why it's, we've got to do um, this process of that we build the capability and capacity of the people to go through a lot of this. You know, like, I could probably cry all night after this because this, it seeps right inside my heart. It happened for so many people and there's so many different stories and, but it all has a connection to what we're all trying to make changes for. And like, you know, Stephen says and so and Tyrants, and it's around talking together and listening and sharing and being courageous to dispel the myth. Because we are heading into the biggest adverse conversation in the nation. Oh, there's a question over here as well. How am I going to get there? Press the green button. Hello? Yes. Um, I would just like your advice on how to answer a question that is thrown at me by a lot of people sitting on the fence. And it's around the whole constitution. And how would you suggest we answer people who query the impact that the voice is going to have on changing the constitution of Australia? It would be really helpful if you could point me in the right direction on that. <laughs> um, my thought on that is that it's drafted ambiguously on purpose. Like every other provision in the Constitution, it's not going to override other provisions or... Like, it will stand on its own to have its own function. It's not... It's not going to adversely affect other people's rights in the Constitution if that's what people are worried about. Yeah. Um, is it more of a, you know, the, the call for detail, as in, like, you know, where we get the question and then it's usually the fear about what's, what's to yeah. come and yeah. maybe yeah, it's more leaning towards, like, the mechanics of government and how it's going to work and, you know, the... The um, you know the rhetoric that's coming through lately is that you know it's going to hold up the high court and um, you know it, it's it's going to change the way government operates and I think that's the design of it. It's going to change the way, but I don't think it's going to halt uh, the government in how it operates and stuff because it has the leverages through the high court or the judiciary and then the you know the parliament and the executive so you know those three arms can still function accordingly and try and work it out and I think uh, we kind of got to embrace this um, you know this unknown about how this new uh, provision in the constitution will actually impact government but it's been drafted in such a way that uh, you know it's it's going to have a a beneficial impact for the government, <laughs> even though it might like it, because the Australian people have voted for it. And to add one final comment, it's to give the government the power to create the voice. It's not doing anything else. With us. Yeah, exactly. And I think people sometimes confuse, you know, projects of equality with projects of equity. Um, and this is a project of equity. It's about restoring um, a level playing field 
um, and it's about advancing, you know, Indigenous peoples who have been for so long not recognised and dispossessed. And so I think people have to understand, um, you know, what we are asking the Constitution to do. You know, I still think there are, you know, there are still race-based um, powers in there. You know, it's not this, you know, beautiful project about perfect equality. Um, and what this is is addressing an emission. And for a simpler term, if you think about the rule books of sport, and if we had stuck with the same rule, you think how many times that those rule books have changed to accommodate a fairer and equitable playing field. That's what we're asking for. Hello. Hello. Oh, that's great. Um, my name's Joanna Robertson. I've got a little place on the beach in Fremantle called Cadogo Art House. I came to Western Australia 32 years ago as an Irish artist. And when I was in Ireland, we were studying Aboriginal art. And all I wanted to do when I arrived in Australia was meet Aboriginal people. I have had this amazing 32 years of working with Aboriginal people, and it's been a huge privilege. It is very um, amazing listening to you tonight. Um, Carol, you've had me in tears. Um, I've spoken with you many times over the years. I've just come back from a month in Ireland, and um, my, I've got two ideas I want to share with you about and share with the people here about what we could do to help get more people to vote for Yes. I th spoke to um, someone I know who is in polling and politics and getting people elected two days ago. He said, if we go to the vote today, with all the messing around as you spoke about, we will probably not get the numbers to get a yes vote because of all the p newspaper stuff. And I said, OK, you get people elected he said it's a numbers game and what you've got to do, and one of his suggestions was, if every single person here, he said we've got to convince the over 55 people, the white over 55 people. He said if every single person here was able to get to their children, their daughters, not the children, the daughters, and get the daughters to work on their parents and to work on their grandparents and get one person in each family to vote yes and change their mind, the numbers will be there. Another idea that I've got, so I just want to put that to you as somebody whose his whole world has been doing that. My idea, I'm from Ireland. Ireland has had, got a history of um, terrible colonial history. But when the Irish came to Western Australia, the Aboriginal people took the Irish in. And I started a festival for three years, saying the Irish Aboriginal Festival, telling those stories and bringing them to light. And there were love stories, there was friendship, there was... Without the help of the Aboriginal people, the Irish would not have thrived or survived or managed at all in, in Australia. I think it's up to us, and me certainly as an Irish person, to contact everyone I know in Ireland, to tell everyone they know who's Irish and all their friends in Australia to vote yes. It doesn't matter if they don't understand why. <laughs> Just vote yes. And if... The Jewish community and the Portuguese community and the Italian community and the French community do exactly the same, which is use the power of our international connections to get the local people here across Australia to just do that, just do that to th for us, for us who live here, so that we can make sure that the people of Australia, the original people of Australia, have this vote have this voice, and that we, living privilegedly in Australia, can be proud and not um, send a message to the whole world that we are just this terrible nation of people because we did not want to help the Aboriginal people. That's two ideas I'd like you to share. Thanks. Thanks, Joanna. Yes. Um Great ideas, but I think, you know, we're more savvy too. We've all have access to phones and computers, 
start your own network, you've got family, get it out there, push it through. But I think um, in, in, in what we're living in, um, it, when I talk about being courageous, we have to stand up ourselves. That's what we have to get through. Is this is going to be the vote for you as the Australian person voting with legal voting age to vote in this place. And it's something that we have an opportunity for changing the future, which could help heal a nation. We have time for about two more questions. I can see two, there's one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rachel. Thanks so much for um, speaking so openly tonight and I appreciate um, that you're standing there on, on behalf of all of these um, people who've suffered oppression for so long. Um, I was just wondering if it would help if everyone just bombarded the newspapers with letters to editors because the over 55s are usually still the people buying newspapers. <laughs> um, yeah. That was just um, something to offer. Um, Has anyone got a question? I, I have a question. Sorry. Over here? Okay. Oh, I might have to pass it back a little bit. To pass it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to, first I have a comment, then I have a question. My first comment is to s say a massive thank you because the cultural load of what you've done tonight in educating us allies is huge. I can see it on your faces, I can see it in your body and it's so important. So I just want to say a big thank you. Um, and <laughs> But my question is about, um, you said the 80% are for the vote. And I think, you know, I'm in a, my friends, my family, the allies, they want to see what's best. But the confusion is coming from articles, like I had one earmarked, but I'll just talk, about saying we want a seat at the table, we don't want to be passing slips of paper through the cracks. And I think that's where the confusion comes about the no vote because they, um, people think that there's more. We want, we want treaty, we want more. And so what you've said about the fact that we need this first is really important. But what I'm really curious about is where can I get that information to share with the Allies so that that one Aboriginal person they might work with or be friends with who is like, no, nah, it's not enough, we only want treaty or nothing to help educate them as well, because they might not know the full extent of how this can build something greater. Yeah, so that's on the ulurustatement.org website. It outlines all of it and why it's been done in this intended order. Awesome, thank there's you. Some, even on YouTube, there's some really um, amazing, um, very s simple messages that takes these questions deeper. I mean, I, I looked through tonight and I was thinking, you know, if people look at that and then send that on to people because it's, I mean, that's what you just need to know. It's where you can access some of this information. Um, we can't stop um, what's being said and all the influence, you know. We've got massive media um, company against us that influences so much. Um, but I guess um, they're not going to be voting. <laughs> we are. All of us yeah. are. And I think that's what we've got to be mindful of. That's why I say we have to be courageous that this is a step for change for the voting generation in 2023. That's what we're making. We're going to, we're going to make our own history with this. Yeah, yeah I, th I see this as a step in building political capital. Um, and so, you know, it def definitely doesn't preclude any of the um, treaty agreements and negotiations that are taking part at the moment. And they're happening, they're happening, but they're happening at this state level. This is not the federal jurisdiction. Well, thank you all for your questions tonight. Um, if you could please put your hands together for our amazing panel. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, what an absolute gift this panel has given to each of you tonight. But as so many of you have mentioned, this is just the start of the journey of information and knowledge that you're now charged with sharing with people. Um, as uh, one of you mentioned, the, the cultural burden and the load of this work is, is heavy. And um, looking at Stephen, it ages us quickly. <laughs> I joke, I joke. <laughs> you get better with age, Stephen. Um, but, it, but more seriously, it is, it is a huge burden and um, we share the information that we share and we do the work that we do because we're so deeply invested in our people and our country and our community and the future. I haven't had children, but I know Stephen has and many of you do. Um, and I have nieces and nephews and I, I just want for them to have a future which is bright and in 20 years for them not to be having a conversation about a document that is only 100 and something years old and which defines the way we engage with each other and, and the laws of a nation that are so written in bloodshed and kind of atrocity. I want for there to be something in our history for my nieces and nephews to look back on that they can be proud of and that their parents and their uncles and aunties were a part of and that you were a part of. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a really, really challenging time for us all, but I'm, um, it's on nights like tonight that I'm so proud to work for Fremantle Arts Centre here at Walilap to be able to convene such incredible minds and generous humans together to share with us their unique perspectives which are informed through so many thousands of years of connection to this place and um, and to, to have such a, a generous crowd who are not afraid to ask questions and to, to kind of have a conversation about this thing which will define um, the history of uh, our grandchildren and, and all of those people that we'll be connected to who will look back on our decisions. A um, couple of kind of phrases that came out were like, obviously, not about us without us. That's a, a, a key thing that so many of us kind of have to say at many junctures in our personal and professional lives. Another thing that I think Tyson said is we're not asking for a lot. Like it's a choice we make together, right? Um, but it's a choice about us. And so please make the right one. Um, so I'd like to thank you all on the panel for joining us and for sharing and your generosity and wisdom and knowledge and care. Thank you for being such an incredible crowd and audience who listened so passionately and supported this group of people while they undertook more of their cultural work. Um, and, you know, we do this all the time here at Fremantle Arts Centre. We're about creating beautiful space for people to share generously and honestly and truthfully. And as Annie Carroll said, truth telling isn't just about us telling you. Um, so we invite these conversations about all the truths, whether they be good or bad or positive or negative or full of tears and heartache. Um, they are our history. They are our story. So thank you for coming. The next one of these will be on Tuesday the 4th of uh, July for NADOT Week, um, which will be a, uh, a night that looks at what reconciliation can achieve when it's done at its highest level of excellence within arts and making practices and design um, in a a night that looks at Kurumpa Kumpu Strong Spirit, um, an intercultural design collaboration that you'll be able to see relocated into a new gallery space next week. So please come back and um, check out the exhibition and do come along to our next one. And please go forth and share what you've heard tonight. Um, this is just the start of our story. So thank you very much.